you so much uh, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to talk today um, not only about the book 100% Clean Renewable Energy and Storage for Everything, uh, but also about the actual transitions of energy uh, in countries and states and cities and towns and individual buildings uh, throughout the world. And we need this transition as fast as possible uh, with ideally 80 to 80% or more by 2030 and 100% ideally by 2035 or 40, um, but certainly no later than 2050. Um, the, you know, I got into this field, well, I really uh, started this when I was a young teenager, around 13 years old, I became concerned about air pollution that I saw in Los Angeles and San Diego and California. And I thought to myself at that time, why should people live like this? I thought, you know, this is this is a problem that really should be addressed. And when I grow up, this is what I want to address. So I, you know, came. I've kind of dedicated my my studies and my career subsequently to trying to understand and solve large scale air pollution and then ultimately climate problems. And air pollution today causes about seven million premature deaths worldwide, including about twenty percent of these are children under the age of five years old. And based on statistical cost of life, that's about $30 trillion per year today. Uh, global warming is expected to cost the world, you know, when you consider about the social cost of energy in 2050 of about $500 a ton, uh, that's about 25 to $30 trillion per year by 2050. So that's a, these are two major problems. And a third problem we're trying to solve is energy security. I mean, fossil fuels uh, won't last forever. They are running out. And as that happens, if energy prices increase and you get economic, social, and political instability. So we're trying to avoid all three problems and they're drastic problems that require immediate and substantial solutions. And these solutions need to be implemented quickly and at low cost. Uh, so this is uh, the challenge of our generation. So the idea that uh, a group of us had, and there are now you know, many groups around the world that uh, agree with this, is to transition everything for all energy entirely to clean renewable energy. That's, and, and I define that clean renewable energy as wind, water, and solar. Uh, when I say clean renewable energy, we, we're trying to eliminate air pollution, so we need to eliminate combustion. Combustion is the source of not only air pollutants, but also greenhouse gases and uh, warming and cooling particles. Uh, to the atmosphere. So we're trying to eliminate all pollution. And you really, to do this, we need to eliminate combustion. We can't have burning, even if, in our case, we don't even consider biofuels or bioenergy because you usually burn that bioenergy. But the wind, water, and solar is it's onshore and offshore wind, solar, photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, uh, geothermal, electricity and heat. We consider that part of the water portion, uh, hydropower uh, and tidal and wave power, even though that's not taking off very much right now. Uh, but we would electrify all energy sectors or provide direct heat for those sectors where the electricity and heat come from wind, water, and solar. So for transportation, we use battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell for long distance heavy uh, aircraft and ships and some military equipment and also hydrogen. Um, well, we'll also use some hydrogen eventually for steel production, maybe some electricity and microgrids, but not normal electricity production. Uh, that would be better for batteries and other sources of, of storage. Um, for heating and cooling, we go to, for buildings, mostly electric heat pumps for both air conditioning and uh, air heating and water heating, some solar hot water direct heat or, and preheating water heaters, some geothermal direct heat. Uh, we'd use some district heating and cooling in high dense populated cities. Uh, for industry, we'd go to electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, electric resistance furnaces, etc. cetera. Uh, so all electric technologies for industry. And these are existing technologies, in fact, 90 to 95% of all the technologies we need for everything are already existing and the rest are possible, but uh, just need a little more time to be, to be uh, commercialized. So just to give you some ideas, most of you are familiar with uh, these renewable energy sources, onshore wind, you know, they don't take up much uh, footprint on the ground. You can see like these wind turbines on the left, you know, they hardly take up any ground, ground at, the, at the surface. They just need space in between them to reduce interference of one turbine with the next. So you can use wind uh, land for multiple purposes, not only for agriculture and range land and open space, uh, but you can also put solar panels on those lands. So their wind land is often dual purpose land. And offshore wind, of course, doesn't take up any new land. 
solar is not only growing uh, on rooftops and in power plants like on the bottom left and right, uh, but also on float floating solar is now becoming a big thing and covering uh, aquifers and uh, reservoirs with solar and even offshore over the ocean, you know, near uh, coastal areas with calm where you can put uh, tidal uh, breaks and you can put solar on the ocean as well. So this is important for some small countries that don't have a lot of land. Um, we'll get to that later. Uh, now for transportation, we've all seen the growth of electric vehicles, not only for uh, passenger vehicles, but now for uh, for tr uh, trucks, long distance trucks. Uh, now Tesla has, for example, a, a, a semi that goes up to 850 kilometers just on electricity and Nikola uh, advertised that he, the Nikola tray, which goes up to 1200 kilometers on hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, there's a ferry on the bottom left that uh, goes, can go for several hours and also the Proterra electric bus. And there are also, in fact, in, in China, there are like six or 700,000 electric buses already on the road. So these are uh, existing technologies and we need to transition all transportation to either electric or hydrogen fuel cell. And that includes aircraft. I mean, they're already, uh, some small planes that are fully electric or hydrogen fuel cells, you can see in these two examples, but getting the long distance heavy uh, Boeing 747 type planes uh, to hydrogen fuel cell, uh, that is more of a challenge, but it's still technically possible. So it's really a question that we think of implementing and uh, spending a lot of time and effort into in doing that. Now for storage, we're gonna have electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and hydrogen is a source of storage. Uh, electricity storage options, aside from batteries, uh, there's concentrated solar power with storage, pumped hydroelectric, uh, existing hydroelectric dams are basically big batteries that you can discharge uh, quite quickly, uh, flywheels, compressed air storage, gravitational storage of solid masses. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Then heating and cooling storage. Well, there's water tank storage for both heating and cooling. There's ice storage for cooling. There's underground uh, seasonal heat storage in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers. Uh, these are low cost uh, seasonal heat storage that uh, is, uh, is prevalent in Canada and in Northern Europe, mostly. And uh, building materials also as a form of storage and hydrogen uh, that we need for long distance heavy transport and in some industry uh, also we can store. Now gravitational storage with solid masses, this is very much like pumped hydro, where when you have excess electricity from wind or solar, you use it to uh, lift a mass in the on the left. It's a case in that, that case it's a concrete block. On the right, it's a uh, pushing a train up a hill that where the train is filled with concrete or rocks. And then when you need electricity, you lower the concrete block or let the train roll down the hill, and the uh, motor turns into a generator to generate electricity. Now for heat and cold storage, this is actually a fourth generation district heating system at Stanford University. Uh, in 2016, Stanford uh, ran 80% of its electricity and heat came from a natural gas cogeneration plant that ironically was right outside my building. And they bulldozed that and replaced it with this gener fourth generation district heating system where uh, electric heat pumps, oops, electric heat pumps are used to, uh, for heating the hot water and cooling the cold water. So the red uh, barrel there is a boiler and the other two are chillers. And so elaborate piping system is put around, put out throughout the university. And so electricity is used to generate, oops, sorry. Uh, like electricity is used to generate the heat, heating and cooling. And also a lot of heat and cold is recycled because at any given time, uh, the university is uh, using both heat and cold. And when you produce uh, heat, you have waste cold. When you produce cold, you have waste heat. Instead of letting that go to the air, it's captured and recycled into these boilers and chillers. And in any case, so Stanford uh, with this system, and then they purchased 120 megawatts of solar photovoltaics, including 10 on the buildings on the campus and then two power plants. And when the second power plant is completed this, this year, uh, Stanford will be 100% renewables, not only for electricity, but also for heating and cooling. So that's quite a bit. It's, um, it's, and that uh, testifies to the strength of this district heating type system that uh, most district heating systems are in cities. Another type of kind of district heating system is the seasonal heat storage, underground thermal energy storage uh, in Okotoks, Canada. It's an hour south of Calgary. So in 2004 and 5, 52 homes were built with solar collectors on the roof on the top left. 
or the roofs of the garages. And in, this, uh, in these solar collectors, there was a glycol solution that during the long summer days, this solution was heated. Uh, the water was then piped to this building on the right where the heat was uh, transferred to water. So the glycol solution was transferred, uh, the heat was transferred to water. The water is then piped under this, uh, under this uh, field where boreholes had been drilled, these U-shaped boreholes. As the water goes down, the heat gets transferred to the soil. The soil heats up to up to 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that heat is stored up to six months until the winter when the whole system is run in reverse to provide 100% of the heating for these 52 homes on the bottom left. And this play field, uh, kids play on it. I didn't even, when I went there and saw this, I didn't even know it was, uh, that's where the storage was. It was just looked like a normal field. And the, uh, the cost of this is less, the storage portion of the cost is less than a dollar a kilowatt hour of storage. I mean, while batteries are storing electricity, you know, they're around $200 a kilowatt hour. Uh, so this is really low cost storage, so it can afford to be inefficient. It's about 58% round trip efficiency between summer and winter. But this is uh, seasonal heat storage, and this could be done uh, in a lot of different places. And uh, here's another type of seasonal heat storage in, in a water pit. And um, this is in Vogens, Denmark, where these solar collectors similarly collect heat. They transfer the heat to uh, water in this, this swimming pool-like structure that is filled with water and then covered with insulation. And that water temperature gets up to, again, around 80 degrees Celsius, and the heat is stored until winter time. And then the heat is transferred to the uh, few thousand uh, buildings and homes uh, in this town. And again, it's very low cost uh, district heating system. Uh, another type of storage that most people are not familiar with is ice storage. Actually, my university, Stanford, uh, in 1998, they had an ice cube under a building similar to this, where uh, during the day when electric, sorry, during the night when electricity price is low, the electricity is used to produce ice. And then during the daytime, instead of using air conditioning, which uses electricity at peak times of the day, you send water through the coils in the ice and the water is sent to buildings to cool the buildings. And again, this, is, this was around $38 a kilowatt hour of storage to provide the exact same thing as a battery would uh, to try to provide electricity at the peak time of the day in the afternoon. Uh, but the batteries at the time were on the order of $1,000 a kilowatt hour. So a much cheaper form of of effectively electricity storage is ice storage. And these are these ice storage uh, units are used in hospitals, in stadiums, and uh, in lots of places actually around the world. Now, what about individual homes? Uh, we need individuals and you know, not only residential homes, but building commercial buildings, apartment complexes to transition. I'll talk about my own home, which uh, I built from scratch in 2017. And I made sure there was no gas on the property. It was run all on electricity with uh, batteries and uh, efficient energy, uh, and all, well, all electric appliances, heat pumps, and uh, LED lights, induction cooktops. So there are about 13.5, close to 13.5 kilowatts of store of like sorry, uh, solar PV on the roof. There are these four. Tesla uh, wall mount batteries, although I was only allowed to turn on two by my utility and it turned out two was fine. The other two are backup uh, for when the first two either run out or if there's an emergency, uh, but it turns out I only need two for most applications. And heat pump, so I use uh, what's called a ductless mini split electric heat pump, air heater and air conditioner. And so there are the, a bunch of inside units in each one in each major room, like on the left. And then there are two outside units, which basically draw in air or expel air uh, to or from the outside. And heat pumps, they don't create heat. So when creating heat takes you know, a lot of energy, they actually just move heat from the outside to the inside. They take extract heat out of the air and they move it inside uh, using combination of coolant and compression. And this is really efficient. It uses one fourth the energy as a gas heater or even an electric resistance heater for creating heat. And it runs like a refrigerator for air conditioning. And so these heat pump units are really efficient. They hardly use any energy. And for water heating, it's the same thing. You have a water heater heat pump that instead of extracting heat from the air from the outside, it extracts heat from the mechanical room that it sits in. And the nice thing is it boils water, or makes it really hot, just like a normal water heater, uses one fourth the energy. And it also, it cools this room just slightly, just a couple degrees. So you can, you know, you'll notice the slight temperature difference, but it's not that much. And in the summer, that's nice because you can just open the door and you can provide additional air conditioning for the house. 
Um, so this heat pump water heater is very efficient for a stove. Instead of a gas stove or electric resistance, I uh, have an electric induction cooktop. It boils water in half the time as natural gas. It cooks evenly. Um, I'm not a very good uh, cook, but uh, chefs who use these things uh, say that they are really good. And they're, they're, a lot of people don't like to change out their natural gas stove because of the control you have over the cooking. But the induction cooktop uh, is equivalent or better, I say many people. Uh, they're much better than electric resistance stoves, which a lot of people don't like. Uh, just to give you some idea of how cost effective this whole system is, and also I have uh, two electric cars, and so everything is running on electricity. And so since 2017, this will be my fourth full year in, a, in another month or so, but I have three years of data here. I've generated 120% of all my home electricity and vehicle uh, electricity use. So the extra 20% I sent back to the grid and I've sold that to a local community choice aggregation utility I have called Silicon Valley Clean Energy. They actually will buy my solar electricity at the price I would have had to pay for it. So on average, I've gotten over through the first three years, $700 a year back from the extra electricity I sold. On top of that, I've had no electric bill, no natural gas bill or no gasoline bill. And on top of that, I saved by not putting gas on the property, I saved $6,000 in my case. And this shows ranges for you know, typical homeowners. $6,000 in a gas hookup fee. I avoided pipes, another $6,000 or so dollars for pipes. Uh, in a, these are typical uh, ranges of electricity bills that people will save by such a system. You know, a typical person will save four to $15,000 up front plus three to $10,000 per year. And you count the money back and uh, you end up with a payback time with subsidies, plus there are also subsidies on top of that in the US and California. With the subsidies, the payback time is five years. Without subsidies, it's 10 years. But the panels are warranted for 25 years by law. And so this, that's where most of the cost is in the solar PV. And so this is really uh, a no-brainer to do if you're for new, build, new construction homes. In fact, California has a law uh, that as of 2020, that all new homes have to be zero net energy. In other words, they have to produce on site enough renewable electricity uh, to offset their annual and average energy use. Uh, this is really what should be replicated worldwide. Everybody should have solar, no gas. That's the key uh, to, uh, to going to clean renewable energy in the building sector. Now, just to give you an idea of the efficiency of the system, this is the hottest day of the year last year, September 6th, the outside temperature got up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside temperature, I kept constant because you can control the temperature really well with these heat pumps. Just kept it at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see the, the green is the electricity production by the solar. And when it's really hot outside, usually you have a really sunny day. And so that was uh, borne out here. The blue is either the com consumption uh, by the solar directly for mostly the heat pump, uh, or after the sun goes down by the batteries that are storing the electricity. The red is grid electricity. Uh, but on this day, uh, you can see from the numbers on the top right that I've produced a lot more electricity than I consumed, uh, even on the hottest day of the year. And these are days when you had rolling blackouts in California. Of course, with this system, there's no blackout because I produce my own energy and store it in batteries. And that uh, there, but this is what we need again uh, on a large scale, uh, especially places like Texas. And I'll get to Texas in a second, because Texas, the average person in Texas uh, consumes two and a quarter times the electricity as a person in California, because there's really little energy efficiency there. And so if we want to solve electricity problems like in Texas, we have to start with building energy efficiency, uh, preventing leaks. And so people and then using heat pumps instead of these gas heaters. And then we just need a lot less electricity. Um, now in California, these rolling blackouts, part of the problem is some people were blaming renewables, but the real problem is there were not enough of renewables because the peak time of electricity consumption in California is like late in the afternoon, early evening. And this shows uh, offshore wind in California, which there's none installed, but this shows actual wind data from a study a student of mine did a few years ago. And it shows that, and this shows time of day and then by season. You can see in July when you have the most blackouts, uh, if you look at the time of the peaks, well, what time of the peaks? They're between 4 p.m. and uh, 8, 10 p.m. So the perfect time to match the peaks and demand for electricity in California. So growth of offshore wind. 
uh, will actually help reduce blackouts, building energy efficiency, uh, and replacing, getting rid of gas in buildings. They're actually in California, there are 39 cities that have now banned gas in new, in new buildings. So that's a step. We need that not only throughout the US, but worldwide. Um, and what about uh, heating? Like, in this will get to Texas. So I recently did a study looking at what's the correlation between wind power output and building heating load. Because, you know, if we're going to grow renewables, we really need to meet these peaks in not only summer cooling load, but also winter heating load, like in Texas. So this shows for Canada, the US, and Europe, there's a strong correlation, a positive correlation between wind power output and building heating load. In other words, uh, when it gets cold, uh, it's usually windy. And so the more wind power you have installed, uh, the better you uh, can actually meet demands, increased demands in heating uh, in buildings. Uh, because when you have, and the reason is simply meteorological, that generally when you have cold storms coming through, you have uh, lower pressures and you have stronger pressure gradients, stronger pressure gradients mean more winds. And this is borne out in these data, especially at high latitudes. And in, even in Texas, there's a weaker correlation, but there still is a, cor a positive correlation. And what this implies is that, yeah, we just, we need more wind energy. Of course, we need de-icing equipment, which is the problem in Texas, uh, rather than uh, if, you don't, if you don't have de-icing equipment, then you run the risk of it not working. Uh, this shows a little more details for the United States, the same correlation curve on the bottom, but here's actually uh, shows hourly, the actual uh, cold load, heat load, solar output and wind output uh, for the US, average over the US. The blue line on top is you can see the wind output, it's, it's minimum in the summer on average. And this is day of the year, by the way, on the bottom zero to 365 days in a year. And so you can see there's a dip of the wind power output averaged over the US. The other nice thing about this graph is it shows that by aggregating wind over large geographic regions, you smooth out. You don't see any time where there's zero power output from wind anywhere uh, when, well, when you aggregate over the US. Um, so it's very smooth output, but it does dip in the summer, but so does the uh, heat load, which is the black line. It dips at the same time and then the peaks are at the same time too. So you can see that correlation right there in that graph in a time dependence. Now the, the green is the cold load and the uh, red is the solar output and solar output uh, you know, there's less correlation uh, with, although there is, if you look carefully, there is a correlation between the cold requ load requirements and the solar. And just one more thing on this issue, uh, just before this Texas storm, I actually did some simulations for Texas just coincidentally to see, can you keep the grid stable with 100% wind, water, solar? And this is the Texas grid in isolation. And it should, this top line shows uh, the matching of power demand and with supply every 30 seconds for an entire year. And that's, it's hard to see those numbers, but the, the bottom two kind of break down, just look at a hundred day period to see more detail of this uh, at a one hour resolution. And the second graph shows the the blue is the load change, the load plus the changes in storage plus losses from storage and trans losses from transmission distribution and losses from shedding. And the red is the wind, water, solar, electricity and heat generation before losses. And the bottom just shows the electricity generation broken down by wind, solar, hydro, et cetera. And it, the point is that we can match power demand with supply all year in Texas uh, just with wind, water, solar. We don't need gas, coal or nuclear. Uh, which are not part of wind, water, solar. So, okay, so the next question is, and I'll try and speed up here, uh, can the world transition to 100% clean renewable energy for all purposes? We looked at 143 countries, uh, the aggregate demand in all that, those countries in 2016 was 12.6 trillion watts. This is end use demand, what people actually use. That is anticipated to grow to 20.3 terawatts in 2050. But if we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy, our demand goes down 57%. And that's due to five major factors. 21.7% uh, is the efficiency of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles. 3.4% is due to the efficiency of electric industry. 13.2% is due to the efficiency of heat pumps over gas heaters and electric resistance heaters even. 12% uh, is due to eliminating all the energy used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. And then 6.6% is the energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. So we reduce demand uh, simply by transitioning to clean renewable energy. 
And this shows the same thing, but in a time dependence where we get 80% uh, reduction by 2030 and 100% by 2050. The top line shows the business as usual, that energy use is gonna go up to 20.3 terawatts by 2050. And then we, if, but if we electrify, provide the electricity of clean renewable energy, we go down 57%, these five shades of colors down to the 100% line. Then we provide that 100% wind water so, with wind, water and solar. And you can see the distribution between offshore and onshore wind, et cetera. Uh, well, this shows actually the breakdown among all 143 countries that we examine, which represent 99.7% of all world emissions, it shows that we get about 30.5% of all energy worldwide for everything. That's eliminating all fossil fuels, bioenergy and uranium. 30.5% uh, with onshore wind, 14.5% with offshore, 11% with residential rooftop PV, 14% commercial government rooftop PV, 19% PV power plants, 4% uh, CSP, 0.92% uh, geothermal, 5.7% hydro, which all exist today. And then the rest, some tiny amounts of tidal wave. So well, how much land would this all take up? Uh, well, we don't need any new land for tidal wave or offshore wind uh, or rooftop PV. And we're not adding any new hydro. There's a tiny amount of geothermal. So it's really utility PV plus CSP. That's about 0.17% of the world's land. And then onshore winds is about 0.48%. But remember, that's all space, mostly space that you can put some of the PV on. So the total is 0.65%. Well, that compares to in the US, that number would be around 0.8 or 0.9%. But in the US, there's also 1.3% of all land is used for the fossil fuel industry. So there's actually a reduction of land use just to give that a comparison. And I mentioned about keeping the grid stable in Texas. Well, this is, this is for the United States over three years, the whole US. And we were able to keep the grid stable with just wind, water, solar, electricity generation, plus the storage. I talked about all those storage options plus demand response. And this is at low cost and I'll show you the cost, but we were able to do this not only for the US every 30 seconds for three years, but every, all 143 countries when we group the countries into 24 world regions. So what's the, the cost of this? Well, let me look, first of all, at, uh, I looked at another study, uh, isolating countries versus interconnecting them uh, for Europe in particular. So if we like, for example, just, solve wind, water, solar in Norway alone, you know, that the annual cost was about 10.8 billion a year and Denmark alone is 11 billion a year. So, but in the total of those two, if you do them in isolation is 21.8 billion a year. But if we actually interconnect Norway and Denmark, that helps to reduce costs by about 21% because you have a huge hydro uh, resource in Norway and that can benefit the Denmark grid and and this happened, there are actually you know, a few points, like there's a, not only Norway has a lot of hydro, but Switzerland has hydro too. So it turns out by interconnecting geographically dispersed resources, you can reduce costs, make the system more reliable and provide 100% renewable electricity uh, even cheaper. Well, so what's the cost of powering the world with 100% renewables? Well, the capital cost for all 143 countries, which I again said mention, uh, mentioned that they uh, consume 99.7% of all CO2. It's about $73 trillion up front. Uh, US is 7.8 trillion up front. China is 16.6, Europe about 6.2. So this, this is the Green New Deal cost of transitioning all energy to 100% clean renewable energy. And 6.2 trillion or take for the US $8 trillion, well, the US spent $2 trillion just on COVID relief the first time around. And our new president Biden has promised $4 trillion for the energy transition. So that would be half of the capital we need to transition everything for all purposes uh, to efficient energy. And this also shows the cost per unit energy is uh, still low as well. But let's look at the cost on an annual basis. Uh, in 2050, the business as usual cost for all energy worldwide will be about 17.7 trillion. Right now, it's around 11 trillion per year. But the health cost of all the mortalities due to fossil fuels and bioenergy is about 30 trillion per year. Per year. Climate costs about 28 trillion in 2050. So a total of 76 trillion dollars per year versus 6.8 trillion dollars per year for wind, water, solar, replacing all business as usual energy. 
because we have no health costs, we have no climate costs, and our energy cost is 61% lower, mostly because we use 57% less energy, and the rest is because the cost per unit energy is slightly lower with wind, water, solar. So we reduce energy costs 61% and economic or social costs 91%. The social costs, again, are the energy costs plus the health costs uh, plus the climate costs. Now, okay, let's just move to the final phase here is policies. Uh, so can we start, we started these energy plans in 2009 with Mark DeLucchi, uh, who's at UC Davis and myself, and we published this paper that uh, was pretty much panned and people said, well, this is pie in the sky, this is unrealistic, this will never happen, it's impossible. Uh, and this plan was, to, well, it was really to see, can we power the entire world for all purposes uh, with just wind, water, and solar. We did not break this into countries. We just looked at world energy uh, balances. And well, we concluded that, and this was back in 2009, remember, that it was technically and economically possible to transition by 2030. Uh, but for social and political reasons, that that would probably not happen. And you know, more practical timeline, we thought at the time was probably 2050. Uh, for 100%, but 80% by 2030. But we did say that it was technically and economically possible uh, to transition by 2030. Now, I didn't realize at the time, but this was the, turned out to be the scientific basis for the Green New Deal in the US, uh, which is really calls for a transition for, of all energy by 2030 uh, to clean renewable energy, uh, namely wind, water, and solar power. Uh, that hasn't been implemented, but there are laws, that, I mean, there has been a proposed law uh, in the U.S. to go to, um, well, there have been several proposed laws that we'll get to in a second, but so let me just first of all state that since then there have been 21 countries that have committed to 100% renewable electricity. Now electricity is only 20% of all end-use energy, so we need a lot more than that, but it's good to see that uh, there has been a push to have electricity laws put in place not only in 61 countries, but also uh, in many US states and cities that I'll get to in a second. There are 11 countries that are currently at or really to close to uh, or above 100% renewable electricity in the annual average. And this shows their, their top electricity sources. These countries include Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay, Tajikistan, Albania, Scotland, Kenya, Bhutan, and Nepal. Mostly they're powered by hydro, although Scotland is mostly wind and uh, Kenya is mostly geothermal. Uh, in the US, there have been eight proposed laws and resolutions to go to 100% renewables. The first was House Resolution 540 in 2015, which called for 100% clean renewable energy by 2050. None of these has been voted on. Uh, the last two are the US Green New Deal, the House Resolutions 109 and Senate Resolutions 59 in 2019. I'm happy to say that the very first resolution was it was based and it says right in the text that this was based in part on uh, our study for the US where we made plans for all 50 US states to go to 100% renewables. Uh, they stated, whereas in the text of the resolution, it states, whereas a Stanford University study concludes that United States energy supply could be based entirely on renewable energy by the year 2050 using current technologies, that the policies of the US should support a transition to for that goal. Now, Again, this has not been voted on and no, none of these has been voted on, uh, but at the state level, there, there are now laws that have been put in place and executive orders in 14 uh, states and territories, including Rhode Island, DC, Connecticut, Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Washington State, New York, Puerto Rico, Nevada, Maine, Wisconsin, Virginia, New Jersey. The most aggressive of these is in Rhode Island to 100% by 2030. And in the electric power sector, we think that worldwide, it is technically feasible to do this. And uh, so we do think that there is a possibility that we can transition electric power if we put our minds to it. And at least that should be the goal, whether or not we can do it is a, is a really social and political issue. Now there are 176 cities in the US and over 300 worldwide that have committed to 100% renewables and uh, the, Blue ones here are big cities and the, the red ones are kind of smaller cities. But this has really been a, a movement that started uh, not, that started uh, that was because the public was galvanized. And the reason the public was galvanized, well, first the plans were developed and other groups also started developing energy plans. But then we got over 
uh, well, let me jump here, that we got over 100 nonprofits. I helped co-found this nonprofit called the Solutions Project, which the idea was to combine science, business, culture, and community to uh, educate the public and policymakers about these 100% renewable plans. Uh, the, the Solutions Project then organized 100 other nonprofits around this 100% idea. This gathered a movement together uh, that really culminated in the Paris uh, agree at the time of the Paris Agreement. In Paris, there are uh, lots of nonprofits pushing 100% renewables. That led to also companies, a group uh, re100.org started signing up companies to commit to 100% renewables. There are now 280 businesses uh, signed up, including eight of the 10 big biggest businesses in the world in blue here. And the Sierra Club then also took the mantra of 100% renewables and we gave them the plans for each state and they went to cities and signed up all these 176 cities that I mentioned in the US. So there are just a lot of people on the ground uh, in motion helping to transition uh, to get laws in place, to get uh, commitments in place. And, uh, and this has actually resulted in a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits so far. Uh, this is a public opinion survey that was done in 2017 of 26,000 people in 13 countries. And it said that 82% of the world wanted 100% renewables. And this was more than the 66% who believe climate change is a global challenge. Part of the reason that there are more people who believe in renewables than believe in climate change was because renewables uh, make countries more energy independent. Uh, some people believe that renewables boost economic growth, create jobs, reduce costs. So nice thing is, is you don't have to believe in the problem to believe in the solution. We really want people to believe in the solution and to believe in that transition. That's really uh, what will, is necessary to actually affect the transition is having popular support. Okay, so finally, to summarize everything I just talked about, we think that transitioning the world to 100% clean renewable energy I uh, didn't talk about this, but it would be calculated to create 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost worldwide. You'd use only about 0.65% of the world's land for footprint or spacing. It would avoid 7 million air pollution deaths per year. We'd slow then reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world at low cost. Uh, the absolute energy costs are 60% less than fossil fuels in the annual average. Uh, and the absolute energy plus health plus climate costs are 90% less. So we don't think there's any reason not to transition. Uh, I'll just give you some links here. Uh, I am teaching an online, uh, well, there is an existing online course that's, that's a few years old now. There's a few modules. I'm teaching a new online course based on this textbook. Uh, there's all the roadmaps, the scientific roadmaps we've developed for countries and states and cities are found at the second website. The solutionsproject.org has very nice infographic maps where you can connect, you can click on a state or a country or a city and up will pop our energy plan for that location. And then the textbook that I'm talking about today can be found at this, at the last uh, website. And also I post a lot of information on Twitter if people are interested. So with that, I'll stop and try to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening.